Over the past 10 days or so, KitGuru has been teasing you with lots of news about Intel Raptor Lake 13th Gen Core, which is due to launch very soon. The reason we've had to tease you is because we've been under NDA, non-disclosure agreement. But now the Intel innovation event has rolled around and we can say goodbye to this. But from now until happy hour tonight, it's all under embargo. It's going to be September 27th, 9.20 a.m. Pacific. Everything you see, hear, touch and feel this afternoon, under embargo. And we can start to give you some details about Intel's imminent new processors. Intel's making bold claims for the new desktop processors. In the first instance, we're seeing K overclocking SKUs of Core i9, Core i7, Core i5, and the generational increases are absolutely enormous. Just look at those increases in clock speed. The big question is where Intel is getting these new increases from. After all, the fabrication process has barely changed, the e-cores are unchanged, the integrated graphics are unchanged. It has to pretty much boil down to the P-cores, the new Raptor Cove cores which replace the existing Golden Cove in Alder Lake. At IDC in Israel, Isaac Silas of Intel confirmed exactly these points. And at the beginning of Raptor Lake, because we didn't have a lot of resources, we have a very small change to the Raptor Lake core, to the P core. We have no changes at all to the RTL of the E cores. Okay, no changes to the graphics. While that sounds like a small increase, in fact Intel is claiming enormous increases. Single thread, 15%. Multi-thread, over 40%. And then two months ago, we said, no, it's not 25 to 35, it's really 35 to 40. And on the week of PV, we go to 41. This was the history okay, of the great results. And by the way, the same apply for the ST, starting from 7 to 10, ending up with 15. And those guys that know architecture, they know what 15% ST means. It means a new architecture. And tweak it on the same architecture, on the same process. This is, in my view, a miracle. We're going to race through Intel's slide deck for Raptor Lake. See if you can spot any of the gotchas that are intended to evade our attention. It's worth reminding ourselves that with Alder Lake, the big change apart from the Intel 7 process was the introduction of hybrid architecture, a combination of P cores and E cores. It's also worth reminding you this was the time when Microsoft was introducing Windows 11 and the statement from Intel was that hybrid architecture requires Windows 11. This isn't entirely accurate. We certainly found that Alder Lake worked on Windows 10. Nonetheless, when Alder Lake was introduced, things were in flux. We have the Intel 7 process, hybrid architecture, combination of P cores and E cores, thread director to manage those cores, and DDR5 memory support. As you know, Gen 5 for graphics and for storage is not yet relevant. The performance hybrid architecture journey continues. And looking to the right, Meteor Lake and Arrow Lake will use a tiled structure for the processor with integrated AI, i.e. an accelerator, and also tiled GPU architecture. Hello, TSMC. Here we have the 13th gen family. Clearly, we're going to see laptops in the next few months, probably at CES. Right now, we're looking at desktops, and you can forget the low-power stuff. It's only the high-end K SKUs that we're looking at. So here's the big claim, world's fastest gaming experience. Considering that AMD Zen 4 launched yesterday and did blooming well, and we've seen how well AMD's 3D approach works, so Zen 4 with 3D cache at CES 2023, that's something to watch out for. Nonetheless, Intel is saying that their new Core i9 world's best gaming experience, a leap for creators and also unmatched overclocking experience. In fairness, the Zen 4 runs so close to its thermal limits, overclocking doesn't really work that well. A reminder about the cache in 12th gen Alder Lake. We've got different levels of cache for the P cores and the E cores. One and a quarter megabytes per P core, two megabytes per E core complex, i.e. cluster of four E cores. Moving forward, the world's fastest desktop processor, the i9-13900K. P cores, 5.8 gigahertz. 
double the number of e-cores, i.e. from 8 to 16. L2 cache increased. You now get 2 megabytes per p-core and 4 megabytes per quad e-core cluster. And look, delivering up to 15% single thread, 41% multi-thread. Those are huge numbers. Here we have a breakdown of what you get in Raptor Lake in terms of the spec, but give or take, it's a better version of Alder Lake. One significant change, the increase in the memory speed, DDR5 5600 out of the box. World's best overclocking experience. They're talking here about their own overclocking software, which has been tweaked. It has to be said that Intel XTU is actually pretty blooming good. Their one-click overclocking works well with Alder Lake. They claim it works even better with Raptor Lake. Here we have the feeds and speeds for 12th gen and for 13th gen. And then we get a comparison of the generational changes, i.e. i5-13-600 against i5-12-600, same for i7, same for i9. With the i5, you get more cores, more threads. You will note that's four cores, four threads, so four e-cores. 200 megahertz faster turbo. With the i7, the same deal, four extra e-cores, so four extra threads, 400 megahertz more on the turbo. That's a lot. And then the i9 13900K, plus eight cores, plus eight threads. They've increased the efficient core count by eight. So you get eight p-cores, 16 e-cores, 24 cores in total, 32 threads in total. The maths is a bit confusing. Up to 5.8 gigahertz on the turbo, plus 600 megahertz turbo. It was simply impossible to overclock your 12900K Alder Lake by 600 megahertz on any form of rational cooling other than liquid nitrogen. Marcus Kennedy, who we interviewed in Israel, took to the stage to tell us what this means in the real world, in particular to creators and to gamers. We have a chart comparing the i9 13900K to the i9 12900K. The worst case scenario ought to be you don't get any improvement from Raptor Lake. The best case should be a significant boost and they're showing their League of Legends something like 20% boost. Obviously, these are Intel's figures, take them with a pinch of salt. And then we drill down further into some gaming boosts. Those are some huge claims by Intel. Clearly, these are cherry-picked games, but just look at Marvel Spider-Man Remastered, a game that we know benefits from CPU grunt. Intel also wanted to talk about frame rate in gaming, frame consistency. The 99th percentile means that you get Pretty much every frame is a good one. You might get the occasional drop, but they are few and far between. Content creation, similar story, showing Puget Bench, and just look there. Obviously they're comparing Zen 3 because Zen 4 wasn't available when they did these figures, but the claims are enormous. Despite those claims about extra turbo speed out of the box, Intel also tells us you can overclock these CPUs hugely if you use correct cooling. We saw an i9 being overclocked at 8 gigahertz. Clearly, we assume it's a very good i9, but the fact is Intel is standing by the speed of their new CPUs. So to sum up, the new i9 up to 5.8 gigahertz, 15% better single thread, 41% better multi-thread, much better for gamers, much better for creators. What's not to like? How has Intel achieved this with Raptor Lake? The Intel 7 process has been updated in some unspecified manner. We don't know what a third gen SuperVIN transistor is. They are faster, up to 600 megahertz faster, and you get more cash. There was some talk about how power management and firmware within each of the cores, it sounded like they're talking about the management engine. The implication is they've removed the brakes and then they've added a throttle, if that makes sense. So these cores basically run flat out and are then held back to control the power and to maintain reasonable levels of cooling. Double the efficient cores. Well, yes, this is part of the reason why we weren't allowed to show you those close-up die shots. Adding extra e-cores, you might yawn and say, well, who cares about these atom cores? And that's a reasonable point. But the fact is you get more of them and they're running faster. These e-cores, in our experience, are equivalent to Skylake cores. They are not a waste of space question is, how many of them do you actually need? Raptor Lake has better memory latency and bandwidth. And look at that memory speed. 5600 mega transfers DDR5 out of the box. Faster fabric, larger shared L3 cache. Here we have a breakdown of where that 15% and 41% comes from. It's not all from one place. 
clearly the 41% threads, i.e. the extra E cores, is a big part of it. So if you have a task that's using, say, four or six of your P cores and ignoring the E cores, the threads part you can take out of the equation, but the frequency, memory, and cache should all play their part. Also interesting, the extra DDR5 speed, the memory slice there, is pretty blooming tiny in terms of its contribution to performance. When you look at Raptor Lake and you look at their claims for what they can do on the same levels of power, it's really impressive considering this is fundamentally the same architecture as Alder Lake. They are claiming a Core i9 Raptor Lake on 65 watts matches an Alder Lake i9 at four times, give or take, the power. Run the new Raptor Lake at 115 watts, it beats the Alder Lake running at twice the power. And the upshot is Core i9 13900K is absolutely blooming amazing according to Intel. Those comparisons are generation on generation, so 13th gen Core i9 versus 12th gen Core i9, and so on for i7 and i5. What does that mean in practice when we actually compare those two processors and look closely? With the Core i9s, there's a big change between the two processors, as the 13900K has 16 E cores, 32 threads, where the 12900K has 8 E cores and 24 threads. As we go across the spec, we can see the new processor has more cache, much higher clock speed, both for the P cores and the E cores. The integrated graphics are the same. There's no change in PCI Express. We have faster DDR5 memory support, and the power limit is approximately the same. 253 watts max turbo against 241 watts. Step down to Core i7, so the 13700K has 8 E cores, where the 12700K has 4 E cores. So, 4 more threads, slightly more cache, a lot more L2 cache, significantly higher clock speeds, both for P cores and E cores. Same graphics, increased speed for DDR5, but look at the turbo power, 253 watts against 190 watts. And then you look at the Core i5. We loved the Core i5 12600K. It's a champion gaming processor. Let's see how it compares to the new 13600K. The new Raptor Lake i5 has eight E cores against four, so that's 20 threads against 16. It has a decent chunk of extra cache, slightly higher clock speeds, the integrated graphics are unchanged, you've got faster DDR5 support, and the power limit has gone up on the turbo from 150 watts to 181 watts. The most interesting comparison in my eyes, so we can look at cores for cores, is the i9 12900K Alder Lake and the i7 13700K Raptor Lake. So we've got 8 plus 8 cores, 24 threads, the same amount of smart cache, we've got more L2 cache in the new 13700, slightly higher clock speeds, 2 or 300 megahertz, the same integrated graphics, faster DDR5, and very similar power limits. So yes, generation on generation Raptor Lake makes huge steps, we can see that. When you drill down and compare processors with a similar specification, in this case the new i7 against the old i9, perhaps the changes aren't quite as dramatic as they first appear. Rumours about Raptor Lake started to break months ago, and at the time it seemed faster DDR5, increased E cores, whoopity do. Intel's claims are a long way removed from those rumours. The extra clock speeds and extra 600 megahertz turbo speed is just enormous. Balanced against that, AMD Zen 4 has launched and those Ryzen 7000 processors are absolute beasts. The operating speed is enormous and of course they also have support for DDR5. However, the operating temperatures they disconcert me. 95 Celsius for a mid-range processor strikes me as excessive. Having said that, I've just ordered myself a new Ryzen 7 today, so I'll be seeing for myself in the very near future. Also, we have reviews of the new Intel hardware coming up in the near future. The end of 2022 is looking exciting, and I can't wait for CES 2023 in January.